we stop every 30 feet. A soldier comes on and checks our identification. You need to download this app when you come to Ukraine. It warns you when there's about to be a bombing. It's one thing seeing it on the news, but, but seeing it like this is a whole other story. It is great. Ukraine is great. Maybe some Russian soldiers? stayed behind. Apparently, there is someone in the school. My name is Giuseppe, and I have a mission to travel the world, to meet the most extraordinary people on the planet, and to ask them a simple question. What does happiness mean to you? Welcome to Project Happiness. So we just got to the main bus station in Warsaw. It is freezing cold, starting to snow. But here begins the second part of our journey to Kiev. 14 hours by bus, and then we'll be in the Ukrainian capital. It's freezing. We found the bus. That was the important part, because it's not easy to communicate here. Nobody speaks English. Everyone it's very helpful though, and they all seem to be from Lviv. I think it stops in Lviv, then we'll change buses. It's gonna be a long night. That's me. These seem... Let's sit here. It's the third passport check. We always stop every 30 feet. A soldier comes on and check our identifications. We're the only non-Ukrainians on the bus. The baby won't stop crying. It's going to be a long night. We just arrived in Lviv. Now I have to change buses. Here in Lviv, it seems all quiet. It looks like a city far from the war. But just a few months ago, it was hit very hard by unexpected Russian bombings. All the people fleeing from the east were taking refuge here in Lviv. Bombings destroyed four power plants and brought the entire city to its knees. Now it is full of soldiers who've come to protect it. It's a new bus, but it's the same as before. There are only women, young women and girls probably going back to cities after the Russians left, or they're commuting from Poland back to Ukraine to find their husbands. We're talking to Maria from Oterka, a town near Kharkiv, and she is showing us some photos that she took during the bombing. The city was practically destroyed. She managed to escape with her family. How did your life change after the war? When war uh, starts, after, I am happy to live every day, every day. I'm not, I'm not sad, I'm not depression. I'm happy to live, that's all. It's very simple. You need to download this app when you come to Ukraine. It warns you at least 10 minutes before the sirens when there's going to be a bombing. I said it to the, the region of Kyiv. Probably as we speak, as we're on our way to Kyiv, there are bombings. We did it. We're in Kyiv. After a 20 hour bus ride, it would have been 14, but there were so many checkpoints. They must have checked our passports at least five times. But now we're here and going to the hotel where we will meet our liaison. She'll accompany us and help us to avoid endangering ourselves as much as possible. So we can see the truth 
of what's going on here around Keef and nearby. We're headed to Orenka, a city 30 minutes from Kyiv. It was bombed on March 8, which is World Women's Day. And the people here are still without running water and electricity. I want to gather some stories from Ukrainians who, despite everything, are resisting during a harsh winter. Here we are in Horenka. Maria decided to take me to see this building, which was gutted by a Russian bomb. Una more. Many bombs. Unbelievable. Split in half. So what happened here? Uh, it was uh, 7th of March, the eve of International Women's Day. So um, the local inhabitants uh, uh, told me everybody was in the kitchen busy, like uh, making salads and uh, food uh, for tomorrow to celebrate Women's Day when uh, air uh, alarm was in the air, so everybody went to the shelter, to the basement yeah. of the house, and uh, the bomb uh, hit exactly this building, and eight people with cats and dogs being in shelter were blocked. With, Over there? Yeah. With the, the people were stuck there. Wow. Yeah, not much interest. <laughs> I think it's like sellers of the people, so they kept like winter stuff, yeah. maybe some potatoes or some products for winter. Maria, is, is, is this man who is living... Uh... Where did you live before? I still have one room left. Can we see it? Can we see it? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, everything is happening all at once. The gentleman invited us to drink with them in the basement. But the gentleman who lives in this building is taking us to his house on the top floor to show us the one room that was saved. You can see through the cracks. Wow, look at that. This door is totally bent. It's like uh, going to see a building in the suburbs of Milan. I don't know which was there just yesterday. And, and now it has been totally ripped apart by bombs. And all the people who live there now have to live in basements with no water, no light, no heat. With the only difference being that here the winter is harsh and people die in the cold. We're arrived. Can we go a bit more there? Or? Yeah, but it's dangerous. Okay. He asks if we can go further. Better not. They say it's dangerous to lean more than this, it could collapse at any moment. So we'll stop here. I asked what his house was like, what part of the house this used to be. So, how was the house? Corridor. It was the corridor, one, uh, one. and over there, in front of one, us, uh, it was one. So, uh, you can see the pipes. That's kitchen. Yeah, here there are like shoes of the children. Da, da, da. Oh, <laughs> It is difficult to describe the emotions one feels to see. A house torn apart by a bomb. You just see, floor by floor, these lives which have been destroyed. These families no longer have a roof, a home, but you still can see intimate moments. There's a bathroom wall there, a kitchen over there. I guess I still am not able to comprehend what I'm feeling now, because it's hard to. As you can see, there are a lot of things on the ground. This was his workshop. When they realized they couldn't reach Kiev, because the bridge was blown up, they started fighting the civilians. He lost everything. How can he digest this thing? 
I don't know, it's something from within. I am like a Buddhist. I take everything as it comes. I'm convinced that everything will be fine. We live for the future. Mm. Thank you. Take care. I have to go now. I think he had to run off because volunteers are bringing him dinner. If he misses them, he won't eat. He was very kind to show us something that probably still hurts him. Seeing the house torn apart, destroyed by bombs, is definitely painful for him. No one lives here now, except those who have no other choice, who really lost everything and everyone. And the only thing they have left to survive is a basement and vodka to warm them up. Poor guy. He's missing a leg. There's a soldier outside the supermarket. We're buying some booze and cigarettes for the gentleman we saw back there. Nice to meet you. Giuseppe. Giuseppe. How does he feel to have changed his life completely? I was a mechanic fixing tractors. It was terrible. February 24. At first we were all afraid, but then we had no other choice. So early on I went to enlist. How does his concept of happiness change after the war? This war has taught us many things. To better appreciate peace, family, love. After the war, and. I think we will live well. We did it. The soldier's testimony is very touching because you meet people who were ordinary citizens. He was a mechanic. And now he's a battalion commander. He's required to fight. He does not want to, but he must. What more can he do? So now we're buying some cigarettes, bread and alcohol to give to some folks so they will invite us into their basements and show us how one lives in these uh, bomb-stricken countries. We got everything we needed. Cigarettes, bread, cat food and most importantly, vodka. That will make them happy. Now let's hope it goes well. Because Maria told me these people are unpredictable. Either they'll happily invite us for a drink, or they might try to attack us and rob us. They are desperate people who have nothing. So I want to be on the lookout. <laughs> Is it hard living here? It is. We are used to it. It is really hard. He's showing us what was in this part of the house. Here we had a gymnasium. We used to exercise. There was ping pong, billiards. At one time. We all survived because of this building. When the bomb went off, we were all afraid. So afraid. We were all hiding down here, and even us men were scared. Imagine the women and children. I think we will be fine and eventually survive. We have to think positively. We will survive. Ukraine is strong. We have survived. Putin. What he did, I don't want to swear, but he is a coward. He's explaining that this used to be a gym. Uh, they played sports, they played tennis, ping pong, um, and that must be their shower. They fill this and then they can shower. Something tells me that one of those is for us to drink. It is customary to toast with a shot. It's 11 in the morning. Keep in mind, it's 11 in the morning. 
Uh, so they must be struggling. I think he's inviting me to drink. Vodka? Look. Vodka? Yes. I'll sit by my new buddy. Volunteers brought some meatloaf, bread. And now he's invited me to take a shot of vodka. Oh. Here to warm you up. Glory to Ukraine. Don't forget about us. Glory to Ukraine. This is tough. Let's try the tomatoes. Given that it's often in Ukraine um, too cold to plant tomatoes, to preserve them for winter when they cannot get fresh tomatoes, they conserve them, I think, in salt, and they are the Ukrainian specialty. Or maybe they are pickled. Good. They keep drinking. Now it will be hard to talk. Maria went to the bathroom. We were left. Ukraine is strong. Ukraine is strong. We will win. We'll do everything we can. We will hold out to the end. Everything will be fine, and I want you to understand that what Putin did... He is a bastard. We will all die, but the children will live. I personally could even die right here. I feel bad to be sitting here doing nothing. Why? Is this good? It's not. These are people who have lost everything. I wonder how we would react if we had lost everything, our homes, families, everything. The only thing they have left is alcohol. They stay together. Mary told us that they are happy that we're here, because they have no news, TV, radio, nothing. So, they are happy to talk to us. I had stepped away for a moment. I was going to hitchhike at the supermarket, but a bus came. Oh, this is it? Yeah. Okay, I thought the buses were no longer running. I tried hitchhiking but failed miserably. Fortunately, here a few buses are still running. It's cold as hell. I don't know how those guys we met earlier managed to stay in those basements. It's freezing. This neighborhood is also crumbling. A ghost neighborhood. Scary. It's one thing seeing it on the news, but seeing it like this is a whole other story. This is the irony of life. What it makes me shiver is that here before it was like a private room where you have, you know, your secrets, all your stuff, all your belongings. Yeah, terrible. And now it's destroyed. You don't have anything anymore. It's like someone told you suddenly that you don't own anything. You. What's that, Maria? That's the school? School number two. And the Russians were inside? Uh, yeah. Okay, so we are about to enter a school in which Russian soldiers had barricaded themselves as they were trying to conquer the city. Can we enter? <laughs> See? This letter is of Russian soldiers. The V? Yeah. V and Z. And what, what does it mean? Victor, probably. So here they were uh, Russian soldiers. Yes. They were sleeping there? The... They were sleeping, I believe, on the second floor. The first floor, they... I don't know. This is the school gym. 
It is totally falling apart after the fighting. Clearly, all children in the city can no longer come to this school. The alarm. Hey, Maria. The alarm? Or we, we don't have to do anything? What should we do? The alarm is going off, but Maria is calm. We also need to be calm. There is no other choice. This is graffiti that the Russians left behind. It's a little scary here. I have a feeling that a few Russian soldiers might still be here. But clearly, it's impossible. I hope. They've written a, there are V everywhere, one on this door. What about that? This. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, we are sorry we were forced. What does it mean? We are sorry? We are sorry we were forced. What? This is interesting. Apparently, there is someone in the school. The second door. You see that? You're scared. No. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. We are filming this school. This is a military people uh, oh, wow. working here. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and he was seemingly surprised that there is somebody else here right. in, in the school. Okay. Ah, oh, why don't you ask him about happiness? Yeah, that's... why, why not? They would like to ask you what happiness is to you. This war has taught me to better understand the people around me and their intentions. Now I am happy because I have learned truly how to love the person who is dear to me. The war taught me that you shouldn't get upset about the little things in everyday life. You can overcome any obstacle with the person you love, not alone. We were not expecting someone inside the school. It was a beautiful meeting though. The saddest thing about all of this is that in reality, schools are sacred places which should not be used during wars. This is a war crime the Russians have committed. One of many. They are also using schools. I guess that the first day in Ukraine is over. Now we have to go home before the curfew starts. And tomorrow we resume. We'll go to Bucha and Erpin. It will be even harder. There were unbelievable massacres there. We are going to meet people who have lost loved ones. A new day in Kyiv. They were probably hiding behind it. They used this machine for protection. So the soldiers shot up the whole car. This is war. There's no other choice. You kill or be killed. He was very tall. And they cut off both his legs. They burned him and burned the family as well.